Hi folks, today's lecture uh, is about the uh, problem of weak and failing states. And in the context of the new security agenda, the, there was an enormous amount of interest in intervening in uh, these weak and failing states um, uh, um, after the Cold War, um, thinking that we can go in and um, stop civil wars or stop dictators running bloodthirsty, um, horrible uh, uh, dictatorships and, and fix these countries, right? Bring about uh, liberal democracy and development. Um, and our, our basic strategy was that we, we would uh, come in and smash the, re re the current regime and replace it with uh, uh, you know, someone that a uh, local that uh, we empower and support uh, on the premise uh, on the requirement that they hold uh, elections right? and we would come in and teach them how to run a, an efficient government that uh, that delivers services to the people efficiently and that sort of thing. Uh, and once they have an election, uh, you know, and democracy is established, we get to go home, right? So, and that, um, uh, from the end of the Cold War, and, he, and especially even after 9-11 and the war on terror, like, it became a real security issue in that, these weak and failing states are, are breeding grounds for people who can reach out and, and attack us. So, um, so we've had a lot of interventions, right? UN interventions are, um, uh, uh, have been everywhere uh, <laughs> um, since the Cold War, right? Whereas before that, uh, they were very few and far between. So this lecture is about why that strategy of coming in and supporting someone, putting them in power on the, and then getting them to run some elections. Uh, this lecture is about why that strategy of, of intervention keeps failing, right? It keeps failing to solve the problem of corruption. This is a quote from Thomas Hobbes' uh, book, The Leviathan, uh, written in 1651. Can you pause it and read this quite carefully? Okay, so I'm assuming you've paused it. Please do, because this lecture won't really work if you don't um, uh, pause it and read the, uh, the quotes carefully. So, uh, why... So... Thomas Hobbes' uh, idea of a state of nature where there is no state is kind of like what happens in a civil war or uh, where there's been no state at all. Um, uh, and he makes the argument that this state of nature uh, would be continual fear and danger of violent death and the life of man would be solitary, poor, nasty, brutish and short. Why do you think he says it's that it would be poor because without a state um, you or a police force and you know you would have bandits and so anything you grew or built or whatever to try and better your situation would get stolen right and you'd probably get killed and, and they take burn your house down right? why do you think this why do you think Hobbes says that the state of nature would be very solitary. The life of man would be solitary. Because uh, just like The Walking Dead, if you've seen that TV series, the, the danger doesn't come from the zombies, right, or nature, though nature can be very dangerous, but the real threat comes from other people who will come and take what you have, right, because it is a war against of all against all, right? So, um, so Hobbes's argument is that we need 
uh, this strong state to protect us from falling into a state of nature. And he's actually writing during the, the Glorious Revolution or the, the, the English Civil War between, um, you know, the sort of Democrats and, uh, and uh, the king. Uh, and he was, he was making an argument for, hey, we should um, re reinstate or, or keep the king, right? Because he's the only, we have to have someone with the ultimate authority to smother the violence and make it, um, make it safe, right? And he, he's actually known as like one of the first uh, social contract theorists in that he, part of his argument is saying that there must have been a time, some time in the distant past, where uh, we all got together and made a social contract with each other that we were going to choose a king and he was going to keep us all safe and we we're going to give him all the authority of life and death and and that's his explanation for why we have kings right um it's his ex explanation for why we have states and, and kingdoms and etc so that's one into one argument for how how did we end up with states right the other, another um, argument is by uh, by Mancor Olson, uh, who um, wrote an article called uh, uh, "Democracy, Democracy, Development, and Economics." I think anyway, but um, and he his argument was that no, 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 um, kings don't come about by uh, by being voted in, right? Um, kings come about by being bandits originally, and then bandits that worked out that, oh, if I steal all these crop, he starves to death and I've got nothing to steal the next day or the next year. Better to become a stationary bandit uh, and take half each year, right? And, and that is the genesis, that is the cause, that's the, the genesis of, of kingdoms, right? A stationary bandit, and he, he uh, runs a protection racket, right? Um, uh, a, you know, so he'll go around and say, right, it's time to pay up for uh, all, pay me for the protection I'm, I'm giving you. The farmer says, who are you protecting me from? The bandit says, from me, if you don't give me half your crop, I'll kill you. <laughs> so he gets half the crop. And so that is the, the process where uh, the, uh, the stationary bandit um, puts down roots and uh, controls an area um, and uh, get, you know, he, he needs a gang, so he, he's got a gang and his lieutenants go out and collect the, the taxes. Um, and then through the centuries, right, through or through the generations, people are like, well, why, why do you have this authority to be the king, right? Well, the, the divine right of kings is uh, why, why I have it, right? And they dress themselves in pomp and ceremony to hide the, the truth of the history of they were just bandits that came and, you know, run a protection racket. Right? And that seems to fit much more closely with our uh, our um, limited history of the politics of, of how European states formed at least. So, um, and Hobbes's idea of a social contract is kind of what we're doing when we come in to intervene in a in a civil war or a weak state or whatever, right? We come in and go, look, the people haven't uh, had a chance to to uh, to have a say in in the social contract they they are signing. So we're going to get rid of this evil king or evil regime or bad guys. Put one of our guys uh, up, uh, you know, choose a local and support them uh, for an interim period. Under the under the the uh, strict 
agreement that they would hold elections. Right? Um, and that's our basic strategy, right? We we choose choose a side and um, and force them to to have elections, and that seemed to work in Japan and Germany and Italy after World War Two, um, and that sort of uh, um, made us uh, overconfident about the ability of military force to change the structure of a society away from uh, from violence, right? And the problem is, is that um, it's, uh, it's not possible to choose someone who um, is going to be a, a good leader and bring in democracy, right? Or at least I don't think it is. Um, let me show you the kind of person that comes to the top, that, that becomes a leader of different groups uh, when there is either no state or state has broken down into a civil war, right? And they're the people that we get, they're the ones we have to choose from as to who's going to be our guy, right? Let me show you uh, the kind of person that that is. So is that why your nickname was General Butt Naked? Yes, because I was naked, because I fought naked. A lot of people would drink or do drugs before fighting? Yeah, most of my boys, Yeah. then we drain the blood from the innocent child and drink it before going to battle. So you kill the, the child? Yes. And then drink the blood? Yeah. I left it up on a chopper, I'm gonna eat it. What kind of war is this? Gorilla? World War II. There's World War III. We here at Vice have been fascinated by Liberia for a long time. It's America's first and only foray into quasi-colonialism in Africa. It started as a back to Africa movement for freed slaves. In fact, the Constitution was written in Washington, and Monrovia, the capital city of Liberia, is actually named after President Monroe, and it became a state in the 1840s. So the freed slaves go back to Africa and promptly enslave the native Africans based on the plantation method they had learned in the U.S., which lasts for about 140 years until Samuel K. Doe, the first native African-born Liberian, was elected. But this doesn't last very long. Why? Because an American-educated and some would say American-backed rebel leader named Charles Taylor and his buddy Prince Johnson came from America and overthrew him. We are not a military group here. I'm not a soldier. What we seek to do is to destroy these military dictatorships around Africa. And that's that Charles Taylor violent. If the civilians can throw out the army, wow, we are in trouble. Well, I love it. We will fight to the last man. I will get weapons from wherever I have to get it. If the Pentagon's got some, please give me some. Despite reports that the government wants talks with the rebels, the violence goes on. The government and people of this country assure you that the armed forces will protect them and that the rebel will soon be eliminated. Rebel forces stormed into the center of the capital today. They're now less than a mile from the executive mansion where President Samuel Doe has barricaded himself with about 500 soldiers. In fact, Prince Johnson, who got to Doe before his buddy Charles, ended up torturing him, cutting him up, and is rumored to have eaten him while filming the whole thing. So Charles Taylor finally gets elected with a campaign slogan that reads, He killed my ma, he killed my pa, but I'll still vote for him. And it works. He gets elected. But he's so corrupt that soon after, there's a bunch of warlords fighting for control over Liberia, 
the country devolves into civil war and things go from bad to severely fucked up. I know somebody who want to kill me, if I drop you, I will eat you. Yo. But this is like a civil war on steroids. It's a post-apocalyptic Armageddon with child soldiers smoking heroin, cross-dressing cannibals, systematic rape. It's total hell on earth. We love the music. There's a music. They call it the sound of death. Yeah, but it's the sound of music to us. The legacy of civil war in Liberia is staggering. It's the fourth poorest country in the world. 50% of the country is illiterate. 70% of the female population has been raped. 80% of the population is unemployed. And a large percentage of the population has eaten human flesh. Till the real meat. Every tears of your leg, they eat it every day. You want, you want to see some peace? Happy whole life. Even in Liberia now, whenever you see there are bodies found somewhere or maybe drowning in the river, genital parts are taken off. Some uh, legend have it that the female genital <laughs> is preparing a way where the man can put it here, wallet and carry it around and use it as a source of power. You know, and some people believe that when they do these things, they have power over their, over their colleagues. You know. Charles Taylor won an election with the campaign slogan, he killed my dad, he killed my mum, but I'll still vote for him anyway. How is that possible? That is crazy. What, how did he win that election? Right? Why did they vote for him? Well, it was rigged, right? <laughs> You don't fight a civil war, you know, kill all these hundred thousand people and, and risk everything and get to the top only to have the people decide if you win. That would be crazy. Right? <laughs> so it was rigged. So if the CIA did train and fund and send Charles Taylor to topple the, the military government there, did you do you think that they would have been happy with the way he ran his government after he came to power? Obviously not, right? Like, um, and the point I want to make here, I want you to take away, is not that the U.S. is funding warlords, uh, um, you know, to topple regimes around the world, but well, not only that. But more importantly, that they tried regime change by backing a rebel and the guy they chose, once he came to power, he was worse than the guy that, that they had the problem with, that they wanted, that they toppled. Right? And that's a repeating theme um, through, through the interventions um, in these sort of conflicts. Okay. So why are people, walking around uh, drinking the blood of children and, and walking around with uh, people's genitals in their wallets. Because it's scary as hell, right? <laughs> uh, because violence is a way of controlling people, not just physically, but the threat of it controls people's minds. General Butt Naked scared the hell out of those around him by being the first to drink the blood of a child. That allowed him to control to to become the leader of his gang and and control them uh, and when society breaks down violence is how things become structured right um, the most extreme the most violent are the ones that become the leaders right Violence is power. Violence is a currency. Violence is how the society becomes ordered when, uh, when authority breaks down, and you you enter a, a um, Hobbesian uh, uh, state of nature. Okay, so when we intervene in a society like this that has collapsed into war, or maybe we've done regime change and triggered triggered the war. Um, when we choose sides in a civil war, regardless of which side we choose, that side, that organization will be structured around violence. 
when we forget that and think that the problem is just that these backward societies just don't know how to run an efficient government and just need to be shown how to, uh, you know, how to do the books properly and how to be an efficient bureaucracy, we are taken by surprise by how permanent and ingrained the corruption is. And that's, that's a theme throughout, um, throughout our interventions recently in these sort of uh, places. So, for example, in 2010 uh, in Afghanistan, the US decided that the problem with state building failures previously was that it hadn't been done with enough resources uh, to provide both security and efficient delivery of government services. Uh, so in 2010, the US sent a surge of extra troops to Afghanistan, uh, which culminated in the largest offensive uh, of the war, aimed at taking the, the, the village of uh, Maja. And Maja was a very strategically important uh, village for the Taliban because it was right in the middle of the poppy growing uh, uh, areas. And uh, by basing themselves there, the Taliban was able to control the entire area and, and the income that it, that it brought them. So the US's idea was that this was going to be a demonstration piece. Right? Uh, they were going to seal it off, provide uh, security, uh, good, uh, change the government and run it efficiently. Uh, a demonstration piece of if showing people what they were offering, if not democracy, right, uh, at least modernity, development, uh, efficient government that is focused on s providing services rather than stealing from you. Um, uh, so, so let me get you r to read a, a quote. Uh, um, this is how it was reported before uh, the offensive before going in. This is what um, the the military was saying. Just pause it here and, and have a careful read of this. Okay, now I'm assuming you, you pause that. Please, please do so. Um, but three years later, the US uh, had installed a new government in, in Majar. So three years after that, Right, um, providing security, providing government uh, bureaucracy, uh, uh, good services. Three years later, this is how it was described. Have a read of this. So pause it and have a have a read of this. Okay, so I'm assuming that you've paused it and read that, right? So this reversion to patrimonial uh, systems of control and governments, you know, there's this paying bribes and uh, um, protection racket, um, bullying and stuff like that, was the, the reversion to that was almost immediate, right? They replaced one lot of bad guys with another lot of bad guys. At least the Taliban had some sort of spiritual, um, you know, guide or something that might, that stopped them being completely, um, you know, com thieving completely, right? Um, at least they had some kind of rules, right? Uh, though maybe, you know, maybe rules that we did test and etc. But at least there's some kind of rules, whereas the guys we've brought in have nothing, right? So in May 2010, uh, General McChrystal referred to Maja as a bleeding ulcer. Right? So, so. Uh, the the failure was almost immediate. It would it was a demonstration piece, but not the kind that the coalition had planned for, right? It was a it was a demonstration of the the, the coalition's impotence to actually change the culture, right? Change the society, change the structure of the society, um, and so. After three years of a Western-style intervention, the people of Marja were making a similar comment, a similar argument to Hobbes, that they needed an absolute dictatorship to stamp out corruption. 
and some in the West are now arguing or have argued that we need to uh, we need an absolute dictatorship. We need to empower that to stamp out and change the the, the society, to stamp out the corruption. Right? And and that's that's a serious argument by serious people. You know, um, whenever these uh, interventions start failing badly, or um, uh, but maybe, but one absolute dictator with absolute control is not how. Douglas North, uh, Douglas North, uh, John Wallace and Barry Weingast, uh, they, they wrote an extremely fascinating book called Violence and Social Orders and uh, a conceptual framework for interpreting recorded human history. Right? And so his, his concepts were that uh, he says that violence is controlled in natural states, you know, uh, um, uh, in normal normal states, right, uh, through the create, creation of privileges and, and rents, right? So um, you give someone an office and then they can make money out of it. And that's how you, you gain the support of a coalition of you know, nasty bad guys that will keep everyone's, uh, you know, uh, snout in the trough, right? Um, so, say, North Korea, for example, uh, all it's not just um, Kim Jong-il sitting in his basement with all the money and, and whiskey or something. Uh, he's got a whole support team around him, the military, uh, everyone at the top, uh, is getting a piece of that pie, right? Or else why would they bother? Um, so North's, North's argument is that um, uh, privileges and rents are how the, the a state functions, right? And so by giving violent people privileges and rents, the bandits can stop other bandits fighting him. Right? And this is how kingdoms... Of the centuries past worked. Emperors and kings would give lands uh, and serfs to his captains. His captains would give smaller bits of land and smaller segments of the population to, to lords uh, to extract money from them, etc. So just like a, a mafia organization, everyone is paying uh, as part of one big protection racket and they're paying up the line to the king. Right? Um, and that's how he he uh, jimmies up his and keeps his alliance um, strong, right? And in fact, we are still living in the time of kings and serfs. And until we really understand this, we won't be able to solve the problem of how to transform societies from a patrimonial kingdom where stationary bandits compete for control of territory and serfs to one where you have not only peace but wealth and maybe even liberal democracy right that's the holy grail how do we change the society into a you know into a wealthy healthy liberal democracy um so i couldn't put the the reading uh from a uh, reading from douglas north in it's just too long um but why um but North talks about the difference between a natural state and what he calls an open access state is that an open access state like Australia is where for the most part I can be whatever I want to be right um, there's no uh, um, social strata or, or um, you know there's no lords controlling things right um, it, it is it is um, as much as you know, probably possible. Well, for all intents and purposes, Australia is a um, is a meritocracy, right? The best get to the uh, you know can work their way up uh, to to higher positions, right? Um, uh, so, whereas so that's what North calls an open access society. Whereas he's saying in normal states, in, in kingdoms of the past, uh, 
he you've got what's called a uh, you or what's North's argument is that in a normal normal kingdom or state or whatever your position in life depends upon your relationship to powerful people right it's who you know not what you know right it is not a meritocracy the people that get given uh you know given power by the king is because of their loyalty to the king not because they're good at the job or whatever um So, uh, so in a, so in a very real sense, all the avenues for advancement are closed off, and that's why it's that's why it's called a natural state, not an open access state. So, um, I wish I could do an excursion into into nature to see uh, to see something in the wild, right? To see corruption and and um, uh, and this this n natural state that um, uh, that North talks about, but it would obviously be far too dangerous to take you to uh, you know uh, a civil war somewhere, right? Take you to uh, Afghanistan or wherever. So we can't do that, um, but luckily there is still some real journalism happening, and we can use that. All right, so let me introduce you to a modern day king. Right. This is a documentary from 2000, 2010. There are area boys throughout Lagos. Many are union members, and it's commonly believed that they use their positions as a pretext for extortion and run their neighborhoods like personal fiefdoms. I was on my way uptown to an area called Ashodi, hoping to meet one of the union's top bosses. His name was MC. I had an in with his trusted aide, Mamok. How long have you been working with MC? Mm. Oh, let's say two years, but I, I've known him for like, say, 20 years, forget about it. For 20 years? Yes. You grew up together? Yeah, we grew up together. Yeah. And what is it about the relationship that works? You see, they, 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 they see, I, I believe something that they use. Uh, Should I move up? Which should I How do you do? I'm fine. Do you know me? No. Uh, Louis. Call me Coco. Zaria. Yes, Coco. Uh, people call me Zaria. Yes, Zaria. Coco Zaria. MCs. The MC Vice. Yes, the Vice. Yeah. Yes. 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 I'm in fire. I'm in second in command. Second in command. Yeah. Uh, what do you do? Yeah, I'm the National Union. National Union of yes, Road Transport Work. Yes. And so what are some of your responsibilities? I don't understand it. No, what it basically do? So everything, when MC is not around, you can always count on him. So whatever he does in MC's absence, you take it as if it's MC that is doing it. Do you understand me? Yes, I do. Yes. That's my job. So you have a big team under you, yes. many yeah. people. Yeah. Oh, you can count them, you know. So, no. Numbers of half, yeah. half to pass MC. Mm. Do you understand me? No. Yeah. So, let me let me make a comparison of the president and the vice president. You know, the president. So though he's answerable to everything that happens within his domain, you know, but then you discover that the vice president takes a broader and wider sh responsibility than the president yeah. in terms of uh, mobilization. The vice president does a lot of mobilization than the president. Am I making any sense to you? Yes, you are. So that is what it basically does. How, how many boys do you have under you? You can't count them. Uh, there are just too many. <laughs> and so you would have hundreds of boys under you? Thousands of boys. Like Thousands? Yes. How did you come to be the vice? President. Oh, you know, there are a lot of there are a lot of intrigues. <laughs> is his loyalty, his unflinching, undiluted loyalty to MC Olomo. Just from loyalty to MC. More than twenty was, years. More yeah, but it's more like a court of a king, if you know what I mean. Loyalty, you know. It's the court of a king. You just just you just hit the nail on the head. Where's MC gone? That's it. Oh, he's over 
That's him on the high table, yeah. On the high table? Yeah. The event we'd arrived at was a Muslim celebration. It involved MC donating large amounts of money to a local mosque. I'd hoped it might be a chance to get to know the man himself, but he had other duties to attend to. interview would have to wait. A few days later, hoping to understand more about the finances of his operation, I arranged with Mamok for a tour of MC's territory. There is a tour that you pay. Who does? There's a toll that you, that you pay. The traders? Yes. Who do they pay the toll to? Of course, to MC. All these traders? Yes. And the buses too? Everybody. This is all the boys collecting tolls. Which ones? They don't do it. Collecting tolls from the five people. You understand? Do you know him? I know him. Should we say a quick hello? Hello. How are you doing? How's business? How much? From each what? No, not from each bike man. No. Not from each. 20 now from each bike man. From each bike man? The bikes are like taxis. They're like taxis. Is that right? Yes. And what do you, uh, and you take the fee here? They take the fee here? They take the fee here. Some goes to MC. You know, MC, what, what, He's in charge of collecting. He's in charge, he's in charge of, yeah, he's in charge. So he gives the tickets to them on a kind of contract basis. You understand? So they buy the ticket from him. How the ticket looks like. The National Union of Road Transport Workers. Yes. You see now. Thank you. Okay, okay, okay. And it's good for one day? Yeah. yeah. One day. At the end of the day, um, the guys like that will take their money to MC yes. or just once a week? It's, it's a weekly thing. It's a weekly thing. What are the fees actually for? What service do they provide these these, these boys who uh, who take money from the, the bikers and the, and, the, and, the, and the commercial vehicles? Um, a lot. The police can harass them. So they don't get harassed by the police? They don't get harassed by the police. That is the primary thing. Well, you would think the police would protect them because that's what the police are for, to protect people, isn't it? Uh, yeah, to protect people. Well, you know, sometimes, every, in, all over the world, police can be very, very overseas. So if, if MC is the stationary bandit, then uh, Mamouk, as a, as, a, as a lieutenant, Right, Mamouk has been given a privilege to to be uh, responsible for for an income stream, uh, uh, to be collecting rents, right? Uh, and he runs boys under him, and they collect the rents, and and the protection racket goes all the way up. Right? Um, but why does paying MC mean protection from the police? Is it because MC's area boys will fight the police? Or is it because MC pays the police? Well, the answer to that question would re reveal a lot about whether MC and his area boys are, criminal, are a criminal gang, like what we might have in Australia, uh, say a motorcycle gang or something like the Hills Angels or the Finks, or if the police are taking a cut, uh, then then MC is part of the same organisation as the police, part of the state, right? Part of the state apparatus. Um, and MC isn't a criminal; he's a uh, he's a lord. Right? So I've got six short clips to show you, uh, uh, and we'll see. But this next clip is about four and a half minutes long, and I'll ask two questions afterwards. Who do you think MC was appointed by? And what is it that MC does?
I'd had a call from Mamok. MC, the union kingpin, had agreed to meet me. The venue, his newly built gated mansion. With some time to kill before the interview, Mamok offered to show me a few of its features. This is uh, this is the semi-sitting room. Semi-sitting room. Yes. The main sitting room is there. The main sitting room is there. Yeah. Can you talk me through yeah, the pictures? This is Oluomo with former Miss uh, Commonwealth. A beauty queen. A beauty queen. MC Oluomo with the incumbent executive governor, Fashola. That's MC with Governor Fashola? With governor Fashola. The governor of the whole of Lagos State? Yes, yes. The, inc the incumbent governor. The number one? The number one citizen of the state. So MC know, must know Governor Fashola yes. quite well. Yes. Extremely well. And let's look at this one. Oh, this is MC. It's a portrait by some of the youth as a kind of presentation, as a kind of gift. And this is the main setting room. More pictures. I love it. And what's this one? Uh, it's, it's just uh, on his coronation. See? On your coronation, Ulum of Osho de Solo. He was presented by Happy Sisters Club. On your coronation, what he was crowned yes. Oluomo. Of it's an Solo. official kind of title. Yeah, yes. It's not just a nickname. No, 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 it's not. And that's the costume of the Olomo? costume of the Olomo, yes. Really? That's the costume. For, is it for his whole life? Yes. And there can't be any others. No, there can't be any other. Hmm. There can't be any other. Hello, how are you doing? Good morning. Nice to see you. Nice. All right. Is he ready for us? Not yet. Good no. right. Until he's ready, we should wait here. Yes. Yes. This is like the, the, the waiting room. Yes. Have you control the Okay. Yeah. I'd like to know from MC, you know, what is it you do? How, how do you, what is your role here in, in, in the Lagos community? Do I answer that? Right. Mm. Let me answer the question. Oh, you he explain yes. 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 everything for you. Uh, yes. Yeah. He will explain it better for you. Yes. Okay. Uh, Olomo, he has become like a kind of a body. He has become a body that has so many tentacles, branches. Mm. You know, because for somebody who has I mean, the confidence of an executive governor, incumbent and former, mm. uh, I think that speaks volume of the kind of status. Uh, that pair of that body in that society. And what is it MC does? What's his job? The major thing he does is into transportation. Mm. He's a stakeholder. Mm. Uh, he's a stakeholder in the National Union of Road Transport Worker. Mm. Uh, meaning that he's a state treasurer. He's the state treasurer for treasurer that, union. that union. And, th and that's, uh, that's the union that's in charge of many of the commercial vehicles. Oh, yes, yeah. yes, yes. How they drive, yes. where they park, yes. that kind of thing. Yes, it's in, it's in charge of the treasury. I mean, could you ask MC how he sees himself um, and what his role is in the community? He just sees himself as a privileged person uh, that God has decided to place. And he's been very humble about it. So who do you think MC was uh, appointed by? Huh? Who? So uh, it sounds like he was appointed or at least has the confidence of the governor of the whole state of Lagos, right? And the former governor, from what Mamluk said, uh, he appears to, or at least he's trying to make it appear as though it, he has an official position, right? That he's not a criminal, that he's part of the state, right? So what is it that MC does that he's been very, very humble about, <laughs> as Mamouk said? What do you think is, what is it he does? He runs a protection racket, right? Um, okay. The, the next two minute clip, um, think about what MC and Mamouk's definition of corruption is. I mean, maybe you could ask MC what he thinks are the problems that Lagos faces that he's dealing with. I don't think there is any problem in Lagos. I do not, th I do not think so. 
No problem. No problem. Okay. Okay. On the world stage, there's a perception of corruption. If you say Lagos or you say Nigeria, they say there's a problem with corruption. Yeah, it has to do with the is Lagos. It true? Not Lagos State. No. The, the governor of Lagos State is a very is a man. He's a very disciplined person yes. who tries to let you account for every cobble. Every cobble you spend, yes. you must account for it. Yes. He's a very disciplined person. No one anyone doesn't want, he, does, he doesn't want corruption. He doesn't tolerate it. You're saying there's no uh -huh. corruption in Lagos? No corruption. No known corruption. No known corruption. <laughs> Unless there is unknown, but I don't know. No known corruption. <laughs>
You know, a general select the battle that he fights. You don't yes. fight every battle. Choose your battle. Choose the battle. I'd heard that the campaign for MC to hold on to his position might involve the use of some force, a prospect Mamok seemed quite familiar with. You see, the kind of politics that they play in the West is quite, 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 quite extremely different from the politics we play in this part of the world. Here, in the West, it's not a do or die thing. No. Here, it's a do or die thing. Is it? It is a do or die thing. And how often do people die? Oh, we don't take stock. <laughs> we don't take stock of that. You know. So I think they are putting a podium in place so that the governor can mount the podium and give an address yes. to the people. So I think that's what they're trying who, to do. Who is the, the governor? Did you say? Yeah, the governor. The Lagos State governor? Yes. Is it? It's governor Fasho, though? Yes, he's coming out to give address to them. Out. Yes. This rally is, I mean, it's, it's in a form of protective rally for their offices too. Why would the political parties want to control the leadership of the union? The union, especially the National Union of Road Transport Workers, they play a very magnificent role in the mobilization of the youth. Mobilize the youth? For election. They get the youth to vote a certain yes. way? And the, the youth influence members of the public as well? Yes. Transportation is the bedrock of modern civilization. And I assure you that uh, I will make a representation on your behalf, to Mr. President, before the end of business today. Governor Fashola seemed keen to soothe the crowd's fears. Have a good day. Thank you very much. Everybody's moving now. That is Oloma. Let's go. Good result. Yes. But as the demo came to a close, rumours circulated that MC might be forced to call an election. Mamok was unworried about the outcome, but a clash of some kind seemed likely. So what do you think Mamok's definition of mobilisation is? And it's... Uh, it's um, Interesting to note that when they're talking about youth, I think they're only talking about young men um, of fighting age, right? Mamuk is, sees himself as a samurai, right? Um, can he fight? Oh my goodness! <laughs> so, um, so what does Mamuk mean when he says? Politics in Lagos is do or die, right? Exactly that, right? Politics is violent, but politics is war, right? So he's mobilised, uh, or MC's mobilised his boys to come down and fight, right? So m maybe the challenger um, were, you know, brought... If he had mobilised his guys, maybe there would have been a war, right? Because wars between princes or kings or whatever happens, right? Um, uh, okay, so in so in fact, if you having elections in a natural state, right? So so. Um, closed order king um, patrimonial societies, right? Uh, they don't work in the same way as it does in an open access state like, say, Australia. So we have an election in Australia and we count everyone's vote and the person with the most supporters wins the office, right? Well, in a natural state, I think it works slightly different. They still count. But what they're counting or estimating really is who has more men to go to war with them. They are the ones that win and they do so by forcing either uh, the people they have in their territory to vote a certain way or better yet, they simply forge a whole lot of votes and for force whoever happens to be doing the counting to accept it and announce them the winner. Yeah. Um, and if it's 
if it looks like they can be uh, they can be overthrown, then then it will probably come down to physical violence. Um, so, for example, we have uh, we we've run uh, three elections uh, in Afghanistan since we armed the the Northern Alliance and and took Kabul, um, and and this is how uh, they went. Pause this and pause the video and, and have a quick read of this, please. Yeah. Okay. Uh, and this next one. Uh, so, uh, all of them seem to be aware of the camera and showed no discomfort, right? Um, because it, the camera wasn't there to bust them the, for, for forging things. The camera was probably there to show uh, who, you know, the next few people up the line that the forging was going to plan. Right? Um. These are, in effect, votes for sale. Al Jazeera was shown these voter registration cards in the province of Host in eastern Afghanistan. These cards allow people into polling stations to vote. They have names but no photographs. The man selling them, who didn't want his face filmed, told us there were 200 in total. The price about 10 US dollars per card. There, there were no restrictions from the election commission for these cards. Any man could go and ask for the cards, saying, I have a number of women in the house. You could get as many as you want. That's how I got 200 of the cards. Thousands of other people are doing the same thing. In the neighboring province, Paktia, this man, who actually claims to work for Afghanistan's independent election commission, showed us 150 cards. He says in total he has about a thousand. Uh -huh. I got these cards because I know there will be a lot of fraud. I know I'll be able to sell them. It's a crime, but everyone is doing it. These are in effect these votes for... So no fear of getting caught, right? Like they're just meeting a meeting a demand <laughs> like the, the guy even works for the 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 the, the uh, election authority that would normally be uh, out hunting down um, uh, fraud like this so um, so it's all very open and accepted right uh, and it's because it's it's not democracy as we know it, right? Even if the f fraud comes in uh, for the other party, it'll just be readjusted, right? Because who wins these elections isn't based on the number of votes they have, it's based on the amount of violent power they can bring to bear, right? Um, and if, if they lost, they would just go to war and, you know, force the, the win, right? And so this is, uh, this is all to show for the Western forces, right? Um, let me show you another one. In a house streets away from a polling station in Kandahar, the business of vote rigging. Ballot papers and voting cards strewn across the floor. Fake votes being filled in under the watchful gaze of a border police officer tasked with stopping electoral fraud. So again, no fear of um, being caught. The, there's even a, a, a soldier there, a policeman. Um, overseeing things that you know and he's not there to bust them he's there to to make sure uh, the job's getting done right because this whole this whole charade of elections um, in Afghanistan ha happened this way because the West has had a fundamental misunderstanding about how 
these societies function, right? Um, it's not a meritocracy. Uh, it's not um, structured in that way at all, right? It's structured by violence, structured by uh, um, the the violent specialists control uh, the area, right? Like control the entire uh, social fabric. Um, so it's not it's not free votes. It's not even really fraudulent votes, right? That's all just for show. It doesn't really matter. The the side that is stronger will get called the winner because that is the only way to avoid war. Over the next few days, I was invited by MC and Mamok to join them at a variety of social events. As well as being a union leader, MC found time for a busy schedule of parties. Whatever the true nature of the union and his authority, it was clear MC was well known in Lagos and admired as a kind of celebrity. Among his appearances was another Muslim celebration at which he was guest of honor and eulogized by the local cleric. So, uh, it doesn't look like MC is a criminal, does it? Right. He's um, being praised by the, the local church as he, uh, as he gives them money. Right. So everyone's in on the... the the societal structure of uh, the people at the bottom, um, you know, the tax farmers take money from them and it goes all the way up the, the chain and everyone gets their cut. Um, uh, and, you know, and the church is, uh, the church is, has always, or religion has always played a part in, in legitimising the the authority of uh, specialists in violence okay um, uh, the divine right of kings is is how these kingdoms or these these royals uh, that's the justification for why they have everything and the guys at the you know people at the bottom have nothing right um, and I'm, um, you know, religions, maybe the, um, uh, the, you know, the ultimate uh, protection racket, right? Um, God says, bring me, bring me offerings, or I'll curse you, right? So, uh, uh, a, the ult, you know, the ultimate protection racket. Right? Um, okay, so we, I was talking about. Uh, the difference between Louis's idea of mobilization, right, political mobilization, and and he would he's American, he's thinking, yep, you know, boots on the ground, uh, door knocking, and telling people about the platform, and and you know, convincing people um, uh, uh, but Mamouk's definition, what he means by by mobilization is a military mobilization, right? That's why it's only young men it, uh, of fighting age, right? Um, because they're mobilizing an army to threaten to go to war or maybe even go to war, right? Um, to keep uh, MC's position as the, uh, the treasurer of the union of transport workers, okay? So in this next video, I want to show you the the youth that they've been talking about, the youth that they're mobilizing. These are your boys. Yes. These are your boys. Yes. Who cut you?
Yeah, yeah, come from outside, they come here to warn everybody here, yeah, but we are sick here, yeah. Ah. Someone from outside? Yeah, yeah. someone from outside here, yeah, come here. Why? Why? Well, we are fighting with them, we are struggling to get together. Razak. Razak. I'm Louis. 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 I'm cross and die. Cross and die. If you cross and die, what does yeah. that mean? It simply means that if you cross his way, you die. Hey, guys, go on my way, guy, die. Yeah. Is, that your, is that your name? Yeah, that's my name. Why? Yeah, they call, they, they call me, if they fight everybody, I cause my enemy to kill everybody. What's she going to call me? Yeah, it's all right. Okay, Louis. That's Louis. Louis. Louis is my son. My son. My son. Where do you work? I don't have work. I'm an area boy. You're an area boy. Yeah. But you control an area? Yeah. Control petty. If you get money from controlling petty, they give you some money. If I need money now, go around to dog shop, collecting money. If they don't want to give money, I'll give them slap. I can collect money by force. Can you? Despite the rowdiness of the group, they all owed allegiance to Raji. What do you do? Okay, he's fine. Raji cannot really express himself in English. Maybe I need to assist him. He's talking about national, the union. National Union of Road and Transport Workers. So he's a member. Is he? Yeah. So you're from the union, and then you also you make money from from uh, shops. Shops. Also. Yes. 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 For protection. Yes. Yeah. He said he secures Osho District from the start. I mean the start. I mean the point. Yes. Till the end of uh, the road. From from who? Who do you protect from? From. Crime from gang, other gangs, from police. Who from? Okay, if somebody comes, I mean an outsider, or boys even within the environment, goes out to steal and come into the the exhumed house of the gets rid of him. Yeah. Such person has to out. Can you fight? Yes. How? Bottle and cutlass. Bottle and cutlass. Yes. You've done that. Is that where these? Yes. So, Raj is a scary guy, right? Uh, makes me think of the Hound from uh, Game of Thrones, uh, a loyal foot soldier. And this video, this clip ma makes it very clear that they are extorting money from shop owners, right? And that's and that's half their job. And the other half is to defend their territory from other. Uh, unions probably or you know whatever they they call they're called um, and so what is what is the union of uh, uh, road and transport workers it's a gang right it's a it's a protection racket it's a mafia it's a it's a criminal organization right that's how we would classify it but the and that's how um, that's how Louis sees it. But the the point I want you to take away from this is that this is how uh, states are states have formed um, in human society, right? The the, the specialists in violence um, set themselves up uh, to to collect taxes, right? And not taxes in our sense where the taxes are, are uh, spent on providing services and uh, things to the public. No, this is just uh, for, for uh, keeping the whole thing um, uh, blanketed with uh, you know, threat um, to keep the people paying for personal gain. Right? So... Douglas North would call this um, an elite organisation, right? This union of transport workers, because what the what the this organisation does is give 
give loyal members privileges, right? Make some lords and barons and things like that, right? Or area boys. And gives makes them into uh, gives them the authority to be tax farmers, right? To to collect money on behalf of uh, the king, right? And all that money has to flow up. And it sounds like um, Raj's Raj's unit, Raj's area boys, the area they control. Uh, it sounds like it might be on the edge of the territory of MC because. Uh, they are getting um, uh, bandits from outside, bandits from other unions or other organisations coming in trying to collect money from their shopkeepers, you know, in their, in their area. And so they have to be on patrol and fight them and that sort of thing. So um, the banditry um, uh, becomes more roaming on the edges but tough uh, if you happen to be a shopkeeper on on the border in the borderlands because uh, you're probably getting ro ro uh, robbed twice a day or more right um, and if you don't pay you get a you get a slap from scary Raj or these boys so so you, you work for MC quite closely. Yep. Are you in any way um, worried or troubled by the, the, the little bits of, of, of violence that are in the background that you hear about? Yeah, you know, see, it all depends on your own personal view. You see, uh, in this part of the world, uh, there are some things I've come to understand, which is uh, the ways of the Caribbeans, not the way of the Americans. The way, the way of the Irish sometimes is not the way of the British. So it has become like a, like a way of life in this part of the world for stuff like that, you understand? It seems that in Lagos, there's a system where certain areas, they have a, an area father or a godfather. Kind of. And he's kind of in charge. Yes. And to some extent, he's unaccountable. Yes. He's his own law in his area. He has so much influence and so much respect in his area. Yeah, but of course, fine, but then he and still so has... The question is, like, still do, you has think do you think that's a, a, do you think that's a good system? There is, no, there is no way in the world where you don't have people you account for. Even in Britain. Even in Britain, the Queen is so powerful. Are you making an analogy with the Queen? Yes, the yes. Do you think, but what I'm wondering is, is that good to have someone who is not really um, formally part of the government. He is part of the government. Well, then what? He's part of the union. Yeah, he's, he's, he's part of the union, and at the same time, he's a politician. His authority doesn't come from the government, does it? It, it comes from his ability to dominate no. the area. Uh, yes, his ability to, to dominate the area. Yes. But then he's still subject to the dictates of the governor. Overall, you feel it's positive what MC does? Yes. Do you? Extreme positive. Extreme. Could you find any negative? For now, I can't really tell, frankly. Sirak, because just one good person. One very good person, that's it. A short while later, I said goodbye to MC. Thank you very much. Thank you. Hello. Thank you very much. Thank you. 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 And with that, I was leaving Lagos. Brutal at times and somewhat eccentric, it was, maybe because of that, more vivid than the world I was used to. A city of extremes, in which order and chaos were sometimes hard to tell apart. I wish uh, Louis had, had let Mamuk finish his um, analogy uh, comparing MC uh, and the governor to to uh, the Queen, uh, the Queen of England. Uh, I wish he'd let that run, but it's very obvious from from Mamuk's um, uh, um, strong declarations that that MC is part of the government. Right. 
because the government is not about providing services and looking after people. It's about tax farming, right? It's about extracting wealth from them uh, and doing that through systematic violence and threats of violence. And you could, the similarities between uh, Lagos here and you know something that you would see in Game of Thrones or you know um, uh, a thousand years ago you know knights and uh, kings and um, serfs and and butting up against each other's territories and, and that sort of thing. So the 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 disconnect, the problem that Louis's been having is that uh, he's trying to, he's looking at Lagos as a open access state like Australia, uh, to use Douglas North's um, terms, when it's not an open access, it's a, it's a natural state, like kingdoms of previous centuries. Right? Um, and to to try and change this sort of culture to into an open access um, open access society has been the goal of interventions, but they've they keep failing, right? And they keep failing because the the people that we choose um, have to fit into a system of violence, right? So they end up being exactly the same. It's it's a structural problem. Um, it's interesting that Mamuk here says that he he characterizes it as a racial problem, right? The the people of Ireland aren't the same as the Caribbeans, right? And the Caribbean's way of doing things isn't the same as you know the others. So he gives it a racial spin when actually it's a structural issue, right? That that when societies break down or you know or or haven't ever been states there is the people who come to the top are specialists in violence and they are about extracting wealth right? so the question is how do we change it from from a from that structure to another because simply putting people in on top changing the regime at the top doesn't change the structure of the society. Now, one of the warlords responsible for these atrocities, who fought in all three civil wars, is a guy named General Rambo, who we picked up at a market, and he said, I'll talk to you if you take me to the old headquarters of the rebel factions outside of town. Nice, Billy. When did the hotel stop uh, working? 1990, yeah. Because when of the war. war. Came. Yeah. yeah. At that time, I was in the army as an EFS soldier, master sergeant. Oh, those days, the place was so beautiful, so nice. Our country. Country destroyed beyond all reasonable doubt. There is not easy way to fix it. Everybody stranded around. Bodies were laying all over the city. Yeah. So overnight they go and do their butchery, burn and cook. They had some of the human parts in the way that they carry around and sell. Yeah. Yes, it happened. Many people were not normal because the rebel leaders those time used to send drugs. The cocaine, the bubbles, the doji, the marijuana and all of that. So they do things wrong because of the drugs that they take. So you were one of the ones that came in to take out Taylor? Yes. You think it's a problem that you have all these ex-combatants mm -hmm. who grew up fighting, you fought in three wars. Yeah. They have no money, they have no job, and isn't that a problem? It's a big problem, because where you have mostly the youth that had the muscles that can cause trouble anytime, yeah. and not certified, then that means bad things happen. Yeah. But things are not okay. Anything can happen, anything can blow up anytime. Mm -hmm. The problem here, we don't come out to talk too much. Showcase that bad things are in the land. Yeah. So therefore, the country should be free all the time. Yeah. So I would go to every hole to do session. Mm -hmm. We went in this Lofa jungle for one month. Yeah. We went met people with muscle. They said they can launch the elephant with, 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 with RPG. So they're still there with the guns? Yeah, they stay there with the guns. Yeah. The war is hot. 
So if the rebel forces wanted, they could take over tomorrow? In less than two, three hours. Two, three hours. Sure. Wow. I'm an ambassador of war. Right. So if I see firing coming, that will not be part of it. I will be part. Mm -hmm. Because again, look at no one came in like that. Me, I'm a stress soldier, babe. And I love to be soldier until I die. And do you think there's a possibility of that happening? Yes, when yeah. UN is not here, the possibility that I can happen. Yeah. Yes. So what Rambo is saying is, there's still plenty of guns in Liberia, and him or someone like him can take over Monrovia in two hours if the UN leaves, and the UN is scheduled to leave next year. So. He's saying that the violence is, hasn't changed, right? And you've still got uh, all these young men with muscles that can cause trouble at any time. Um, uh, and I think the, the problem with our inter interventions into these situations over the last you know, 25 years is that those of us lucky enough to live in the developed world in open access societies in liberal democracies find it very difficult to to understand that when a state has a civil war or uh, has never really been a state that the actual fabric of society uh, gets torn apart right and the people who come to the fore in that in that sort of situation are the most violent right um and and that's why uh you know the, the type of person that we have to deal with on both sides will be people like you know general butt naked right? um and so picking supporting a winner isn't going to make them more like us that the system won't change right so the the UN mission there was 14 years or so, um, and so they actually pulled out uh, in December 2017, I think. And so I've got, I've got a couple of quotes um, for you to read about what has happened since. So if you could pause it and, and just read this. Okay, so so the uh, the new the the new leader George Way um, uh, you know corrupt um, the 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 system has not been changed to one of um, government providing services. It's still one of uh, of extracting wealth. Uh, Paul didn't have a read of this one. So, uh, and some, you know, some uh, fairly heavy uh, uh, corruption going on. Twenty five million dollars. Uh, uh, has disappeared and um, uh, so the, despite 14 years of the UN being there uh, supporting democracy and um, elections and things like that uh, the the corruption hasn't gone the system hasn't changed right because it's not really corruption it's it is the structure of a normal state uh, you know what from our point of view from a liberal the liberal democracies um, these open access states that we live in are the exception right to the rule they are bizarre right the natural um, state of things is that when you have no authority uh, you know uh, the violent come to the top and just picking sides and and running elections and uh, uh, you know even providing security and things like that won't stop 
won't stop the corruption. It won't won't change it. And so, uh, our most basic problem in this area, if if we are to continue with the hubris of intervening in other countries to bring about democracy and development, um, is that we we just don't know how to reorder an entire society away from the most violent becoming the most powerful. Right? Like that's, we just haven't been able to solve that. Right? Um, maybe, maybe you'll be part of that solution with your research and ideas. I hope so. All right, I'll leave it there. Um, I'll, I hope you found that that lecture interesting and informative um, and I will see you in the next lecture.